Well, this morning, we're, we are going to continue our study in the book of Acts, and we are going to be in Acts chapter 3 this morning, the first uh, verses 1 to 10. So if you can look that up in your Bibles. And as you're looking it up, let me just give you a quick recap of what we learned about last week. Last week, we talked about church life, didn't we? And we learned uh, the, the first church, the things that they did, the things that they partook of. Now, do you remember some of those things? The church, what were they focused on? What did they study on a daily basis? And they studied scripture, right? They, they studied the apostles' teaching, and they did that because not only I think they were eager to learn, but they wanted to grow closer in their relationship with the Lord. And they went to the temple daily, right? And, and they did that, and there were two different things they did as they gathered together, they spent time together, is they evangelized as well as discipled. Not only that, but they shared things, right? Those who had abundance, right? Those who were rich sold their possessions so that they could help out the poor. And we talked about that last week, the difference between rich and poor. And none of us here probably think that we're rich, but when we look around, we realize, wow, we have a lot of things, more than what we need. How many of you can look in your garage and it's full of stuff. I usually say junk because it probably is junk, but it's stuff. And it's sometimes it's really, does anybody here struggle with parting with that junk that's in your garage? I've been working on, on our garage trying to get rid of junk. And I've done, I, I got a couple of garbage bags taken care of this past week, but it's hard. It's really hard. Oh, I could use that. I could use that, that, that scrap of wood that's like four inches by four inches. You know, who knows? I, I may have a, a, pr a project for that later on down the road. I finally, I did get rid of it, but I know what next, you know, in the next week or two, it's going to come up. Oh, I could have used that. But that's what happens. You know, we're wealthier than we think we are at times. But we can get rid of our stuff to make room for what God wants, and it's detaching ourselves from our worldly possessions because how much of our worldly possessions will we be able to take with us after we leave our life here on earth? Zero, none of it, absolutely none of it. But we can use what we have to help others, to help those in need. Well, today we're gonna get into God's healing power. Luke, because he, the author of Acts, Last week, he, he, he kind of gave a synopsis of church life. Today, we're going to kind of dig into that a little more and give a specific example of what it was, uh, what it was like at the beginning of church, uh, the, the, the church age. But let's go ahead. Before we read God's scripture, let's go ahead and just have a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning, and Lord, you know better than any of us that we have a lot of distractions in our minds. There is a lot going on in the world around us. Lord, we're just busy, busy people. Lord, I pray that this morning that you would calm our spirits, calm our hearts, Lord, that we would be fully focused on you. Lord, I pray for each and every one here. I pray for each and every one who is home listening. Lord, that, um, that you would open our ears, that we would listen to your word, that we would, would be able to apply it to our lives as well. Help us, Lord, to live our lives for you. Help us to be dedicated to your word and your truth. Lord, and be with me this morning as I share your word. Lord, help me to... Speak your words in truth and love, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So please follow along with me as we read Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, 
to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So here we see in the book of Acts something amazing, something incredible happens. So let's go through what is the situation that we find ourselves learning about this morning. So we have, we have two guys. We have Peter and John, and they are going to the temple, right? We learned about that last week. That's what they did on a daily basis. They are going to the temple, to pray and worship, right? They're going the ninth hour, which is at what time during the day? It's at three o'clock in the afternoon. Jews would typically go two times a day to the temple to worship and to offer sacrifice, once at, at nine in the morning, and then the second time at three in the afternoon. So here they go, and what are they approaching? They're approaching the beautiful gate. Now, we don't know exactly what the beautiful gate was, because Luke mentions it here, uh, but we don't have any other record of what exactly it was. But most scholars say that there's, there's one gate that was more beautiful than the other gates. And it was a gate that led from the outer courts to the inner courts. It was a gate where the Gentiles could actually go to that gate, but they could not go beyond. They weren't allowed to go beyond that gate. Even Gentiles who who followed God, they could only get so far. So they go to this gate. They're walking. And who do they see? They see a a lame man who was begging for money. They go and approach. And this man would go there on a regular basis, and people would take him daily to go. And this gate was a great place to be begging, to be asking for money because it was the main entrance into the temple. And when Jews would go to the temple to worship God and there was somebody in need, it was very easy to give them money because not only would you feel guilty about going to worship God and yet not helping somebody in need, but people around you were looking as well. And this man goes and he asks them, he sees them coming, and he asks them to receive alms, to receive money, because he could not work. And it's, is it appropriate for somebody who can't work to ask for help? Absolutely. It is. And God even commanded his people, when you see somebody in need, you help out, right? You help out those in need. Now, as I was reading through this, this lame man, it reminded me a lot of us as people. This man had problems, right? He had issues. Everyone would agree that he had issues. His first issue was that he was born lame. From birth, he couldn't walk. Just like us, we are born with sin in our lives. And we've talked about sin. And sin is anything you think, say, or do that does not please God or breaks his laws. If you define the word sin, it means missing the mark. How many of you have, we have plenty of hunters here, don't we? How many of you have ever missed the mark? How many of you have ever fired a shot and missed? Right? We don't like to admit it, but it happens, right? We all have sinned. From birth, even 
a baby, right? We look at babies and we think, oh, they're so cute. How could anyone who looks so cute be such a sinner? Are babies sinners? Yes, from birth. Now, they may not know what they're doing. They may not realize that what they're doing is wrong, but are babies selfish? Will they let you know when they want something? Yes, and they won't stop until they get what they want. We are born sin, just like this lame man was born lame. He didn't do anything. He, he, it wasn't an old football injury, right? He didn't, he didn't accidentally trip and hurt himself. He was born that way, just like we are born in sin. And because he was born lame, he couldn't walk. He couldn't walk. Just like because we are born in sin, our works, we can't do good works. We can try. We can attempt. But what does the Bible say? Our good works are as what? Filthy rags. We may think they're good, but they're not. And it's because we're born into sin. This man couldn't walk, not because he didn't want to. He wasn't being lazy. It's because he couldn't. Also, because he was lame, he wasn't allowed to enter into the temple. Just like because of our sin, we are not allowed into heaven. Doesn't it seem kind of wrong for God to say, yeah, sorry, I know you're lame and you were there from birth. There's nothing that you did, but you're not allowed into the temple to worship. That may seem kind of unfair to us. But remember, our God is a holy God. Just like it seems, it may seem unfair to us that not everybody is going to go to heaven. Does that seem unfair? It can when we look at it, right? Because God loves everybody. Did God love that lame man? Yeah. But because he loved him, he still couldn't go in. And because of our sin, we cannot go to heaven, not on our own, not on our own. And this man, what was he looking for? What was he begging? He was begging for money, right? He couldn't work. And he was trying to find fulfillment day to day. And he had to get money day to day so that he could buy food, so that he could so that he could survive. And people without Christ, they look for satisfaction too in the world. They go here and they go there. And are they satisfied? No. This morning in Sunday school, we learned about the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. How often did she have to go to the well? She had to go every day because she was thirsty every day. And Jesus told her, that I have something that you will never thirst again, living water. But this man, he had to go every day to get money so he he could provide for his needs. And we try to find satisfaction in the things of this world. Do the things of this world satisfy you? No, it may for a short time, it may be fun or, or exciting. And to prove my point on that, is remember when you were young, you wanted, I'm sure you wanted a specific toy or a bike. There was something that you just had to have. You were not going to be happy unless you had that. And then you got it. Do you still have it? No, probably not. It probably broke or got lost or destroyed. I mean, there's one toy that I can think of that if I had it back, I'd be pretty happy. Not that I would play with it all the time, but it it would bring back some good memories. But it's gone. I don't have it anymore. So there is some similarity, as I, I think, with this lame man and with us as people. And it may seem wrong for that man not to be able to enter into the temple or the fact that he wasn't able to walk on his own. But it's a good reminder that we can't walk on our own either. We can't get to heaven on our own works, on our own ability. So we have this man begging for money. 
And that's what he asks. He, he's sitting there and he sees this man coming. Now he's a professional beggar, right? He does this every single day. And he sees these people coming. And I'm sure he saw them before because Peter and John would be going there on a regular basis. And maybe he, maybe he just knew just by their looking at him, oh yeah, they're going to give me something. Maybe they would usually give him some money. And they were a repeat, you know, customer, repeat giver. And so he's kind of excited. He sees them, but then we notice that he actually looks down. He's looking away. But let's, let's read again the offer that, he, that, that they give, right? Starting with verse 4, right? And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, right? They look at him, and what do they say? Look at us. Look up. And now, okay, is that a good sign? If you're begging for money, and the people walking by, they say, hey, look at us. That's probably a really good sign. Because if you're not going to give, do you want them to look at you? No. If you walk by somebody who, who is asking for money, and you don't want to give them anything, do you look at them? No. You, you look away, and you try to be invisible. It's like we're three years old again, right? And if we, don't, if we can't see them, then they can't see us. So here, Peter says, Look at us. And he's looking, right? And he th- I think that he thinks he's going to get some great news. But what does Peter tell him? He says, we don't have any money. Right? Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Right? We see that. But Peter said, verse 6, I have no silver and gold. Sorry, bud. I know you want money, but guess what? I don't have any. My pockets are empty. How do you think that lame felt in that moment? <sighs> right? Disappointed. Disappointed. Have you ever been disappointed? Yeah, I think we all feel that. But then Peter, on, Peter goes on to say, I have something better. Ooh. What could be better than money? What could be better than silver and gold? If somebody offered you silver and gold, would you be excited about it? Yeah, I'd be a little skeptical. Is this real gold? But if somebody says, you know what, I don't have gold or silver to give you, I have something better. Ooh, you're going to give me a private jet with its own pilot, right? No, what could be, what could be better? What could be better. Well, let's read again about the gift that he gives them. What is better? What is better than silver and gold? I have no silver and gold. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took by, and he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Complete healing. This man, and we'll read later on here in a couple weeks, this man was in his 40s. So he was about my age, had never walked before his entire life, never walked. And he is completely healed. When, when God works a miracle, when he heals, he heals completely. He, when he does it, he does it right. He doesn't just go in halfway. He heals completely. And this man is healed completely. Now, how do we know that he was healed completely? Verse 8, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. He walked, he leapt, and he praised God. And I was thinking about that this morning. Wow, you know, I can walk up here. Should I leap in front of everybody? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've made enough mistakes already this morning. I'm not sure if I'm going to, although I'm sure you would enjoy the show. But he walked and he leapt. He learned, he's probably the, the, the quickest man who learned how to walk, right? He learned to walk in just a minute. Well, not even a minute, just a second, instantaneously. Not only was he walking, but he was jumping. 
And this is Luke here, right? Luke's the author. And when he talks about, right, immediately his feet and ankles, those are medical terms, talking about the ankle bones, the feet bones. Instantly was perfect where he could jump. When we have surgery, right, if you were to, people here, we, we've had like knee surgeries, we've had joint surgeries, right? People here have. Does the doctor say, okay, surgery was a success, now go and do cartwheels or do jumping jacks. Is that what they tell you to do? No. What do they, what do they say? Take it easy. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a slow recovery. And if you listen to your doctor, you end up all right. But if you don't listen and you try to overdo it, what happens? It sets you back. And sometimes you have to have that surgery a second time. But when Jesus heals perfect. It's complete healing. And you notice how Peter heals. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Is that what Jesus did when he healed? Did he say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk? No, he just said, get up and walk. He didn't have to say, it's from him, right? Peter didn't say, in the name of Saint Peter, rise up and walk. Can you imagine how ridiculous that would be if I went to somebody who was sick and said, in the name of Pastor Dave, rise up and walk. You think that would work? No, you guys are listening. No, it wouldn't work at all. You guys are laughing at me. Right? That wouldn't work. Because Peter wasn't in it for himself. It wasn't Peter who was healing. Even though Peter's the one who, who said it, who ultimately healed this man? Jesus Christ of Nazareth healed. It was him. And so many times we see people doing things in order to get credit, in order to get recognition. Was Peter wanting recognition? You know what else is interesting? That this is Peter who is saying this. Just a few weeks ago, during Christ's crucifixion, when people asked Peter, hey, don't you know this man? I don't know him. I've never even heard of this guy. Who are you talking about? Jesus? No, no, don't know no Jesus. He went from that to saying, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Is that a change? That is a change. That is a change. And we're going to start reading here just the impact that this had. Verse 9 again. It says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Right? Others took notice. The people around, they knew this guy. They had seen him for years, every day, going to the temple. This man was not faking it. He wasn't faking being lame. If you were faking that, right, maybe some insurance fraud, could he have kept that up for, I mean, it would have been over 20 years, I would assume. I don't know when he started begging for money. But people saw, they took notice, that, wait, we know this guy. We've given money to this guy to help him. And now he's walking and jumping and praising God. Isn't that absolutely ridiculous, right? And he entered the temple with them, right? Going back to verse 8, he entered the temple. He was never able to do that before. He couldn't do it. He had to be completely healed. We as believers, we are completely healed. Not that we don't sin, but when Christ looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. And when we die, not a matter of if, a matter of when, we'll get to see Jesus. We will be able to enter into heaven, complete, whole, 
with no aches or pains. But others took notice, and there was wonder and amazement. We talked about that last week, right? The apostles were doing these wonders. People who witnessed, people who saw, they were amazed. And we're going to see over the next couple of weeks the process of this, what happens. And uh, Peter's going Peter's to talk. He's going to use this opportunity to further the kingdom of God. He's going to use this opportunity to tell people about Jesus Christ, about what he did for them. And is everybody going to be happy with what's going on? No. Isn't that sad? This miracle happens. A man who was born a cripple is healed and he can now worship God in the temple. And people are upset about it. Are you ever upset when somebody comes to know Christ and is doing well? Sometimes, sometimes we can be judgmental. God, why would you save this person? Don't you realize what this person has done? You can't use them. But we're going to see as we work through the book of Acts that God uses all sorts of people, even people who were murderers. Now, if we were, if, if we as, as humans put a scale about who's deserving of salvation and who's not, would we say a murderer is definitely worthy of God's salvation? No. Especially if it was somebody within your family that they, that they killed. But you know what? God loves us. And God is ready to heal us at any moment. If there is any sin in your life, if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do that this morning. Put your faith and trust in him. Admit that you're a sinner, right? Just like that man had to admit that he couldn't walk. He could have tried, and I'm sure he did when he was younger. I'm sure he tried to walk, but he couldn't. We cannot get to heaven on our own because of the sin, because of our sin. We all have done wrong. But when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then he makes us whole. He makes us complete. And we can worship him. There is nothing then that separates us from worshiping God. In a few moments, we're going to be celebrating, observing communion. Communion is a time that we remember what Jesus Christ did for us. He paid the penalty for us on that cross. He sacrificed for us on that cross. And it wasn't just the physical pain and agony that he suffered. We read in Scripture what was, what was one of the things that Jesus said while he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Think about that. The Godhead was separated at that moment. He did that because he loves you. He paid the price. All we need to do is accept him as our Lord and Savior. So as we spend this, this time, this morning, observing communion, let's spend time remembering what Jesus Christ did for you. Let's pray.